Good morning and welcome to Kingsgate at Home. We are so pleased that you can join us today. And if this is your first time, we pray that you will have a special blessing and we give you a special welcome. The psalmist says in writing about the Sabbath and coming together to worship, he says it's a good thing to give thanks to the Lord, to sing his praises, to declare his loving kindness in the morning and his faithfulness by night. Well, we're delighted this morning that Gina is going to lead us in a time of worship. And after that, Norman will bring a message from God's Word. Uh, one or two things to draw your attention to. This week, Thursday, sees the commencement of another Alpha course. And you can sign up for that by email or visit our website. Details will follow. And then in the week following, we have another one of our Zoom prayer meetings. And it would be wonderful if you could join together in prayer. Prayer is vital at any time, but particularly during uh, this time of coronavirus and all the things that are affecting us. It's prayer that will make the difference. So we really do encourage you to join us on Wednesday, July the 8th for a time of prayer. And now we're going to commit the day to the Lord and Rose is going to pray. Father, we thank you for this new day. May we be conscious of your presence as we come together to worship and listen to your word. We pray a special blessing on those who are finding life difficult at this present time. So help us, Lord, to just feel your presence this morning and to be filled with your love. In Jesus' name. Amen. And now over to Gina. Hi everybody and um, welcome back to Claire's Garden, where she and I will be leading you this morning. Um, I'm going to start this morning by just reading a few verses from Psalm 24, verses 7 to 10. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. And uh, gates and doors and thresholds are very symbolic of Christ being the entry point into the presence of God. And it's through faith in his blood that we can have access into the presence of God the Father. So this morning we're going to start with, by singing the Lion and the Lamb. And we're going to start with verse 2. Open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings.
What a great story we have, a story of hope, of truth, of faithfulness. And we just thank you, Father, that we can declare this from a place of assurance and peace that we have in you. And we just bless you, Lord, that we can have this story, that we can have this story to share, this hope in our hearts to share, Lord. And Father, we just give you the thanks today for who you are and for that blessed assurance that we have in you. Amen.
humble faith. He rules the earth and heavens. His glory knows no measure or refrain. And his bursting past the borderlines of space. Jesus
we thank you Jesus for this time together and we just pray Lord for this week that lies ahead for us God that you would just cause us to look to you and uh, that you'll go with us Lord in that week we just pray now for your word to us Amen God bless and we'll see you soon bye Well, hello there. Um, today we're going to be looking at uh, Luke chapter 6 and just a small passage really from verse 43 uh, down to verse 45. And I'll just read that now from the NIV. No good tree bears bad fruit, and nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognised by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. I guess the um, <clears throat> the, the point of this uh, this little passage is in that last verse for out of the overflow of his heart his mouth speaks and this is really what Jesus is intending to get clear to his disciples as he preaches um, the context of this passage is that uh, Jesus is training his disciples for their future role and uh, but he's not doing this by just giving them information sort of filling up their heads but actually he does this and he does that for us by constantly challenging the state of our hearts. Um, the gospel that they're going to bring these disciples to others is not just designed to uh, feed people's minds, but it is designed to produce a change in heart of those who hear. Listening to him at the same time, of course, we've got the Pharisees. And the Pharisees knew all the details about the law of God and what uh, all that that meant. But actually, they hadn't had a change of heart. Something which was vital for them if they were to know God, which sadly many of them never actually discovered. Later on, we're going to read uh, this verse over and over again. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. And uh, it is possible to have a lot of head knowledge, but if the heart isn't right, uh, that will only lead a person to be proud about the knowledge that they have. And in fact, in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1 and 2, it says this, Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know, but the man who loves God is known by God. So with all that in mind, we're going to start having a look at this, uh, <clears throat> this passage. Jesus wants his disciples to be free of ar arrogance and pride uh, because an arrogant person is basically a very insecure, a very insecure person. And um, the truth of the matter is that we cannot find ultimate security in our achievements because ultimate security can only come from knowing the love of God who is eternal and never changes. 
And so Jesus is using quite an agricultural sort of uh, uh, metaphor here of the tree and its fruit. And um, the image he's using is enabling us or enabling the disciples and us to judge a situation or a person correctly by looking at the fruit or the outcome of their lives. Now, if you were to look into your Bible uh, just a few uh, verses earlier in verse 37, um, uh, Jesus said these words, which David preached on last week. Do not judge and you will not be judged. He also goes on to say, do not condemn and you will not be condemned, but forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your laps. So it's clear that actually, although Jesus said, do not judge, uh, in this passage, he's telling us how to judge correctly. And so what he's saying is, I want you not to be judgmental, but I do want you to be able to make right judgments. And he's about to show us how that can come about. And he is warning us in this passage and the previous part not to be judgmental. We'll deal with that as we get to it. So it's interesting that he would use a tree and its fruit as uh, the illustration of how to make judgments, because um, a tree doesn't immediately have fruit. There's a delay. You plant the tree, uh, you look after it, and there's a delay, and then comes the fruit. And so also Jesus is saying, don't rush to judgment. See, that's what we do when we're judgmental. We, we rush into a judgment. We give our opinion. But actually he's saying, no, don't do that. Don't rush in. But actually wait and see what the outcome of perhaps the teaching or the philosophy or whatever it is that somebody has given. Wait and see what it produces. And then from that basis, start to make a good judgment. So we have this, this phrase in here, uh, no good tree bears bad fruit and no bad tree produces good fruit. And um, Matthew Henry says of this passage that he says, um, the tree actually in this passage represents our hearts and the fruit represents what comes out of our mouths, which is why Jesus ends with this phrase, for out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so there are actually three aspects to uh, this passage. First of all, the one we've already mentioned, observing good and bad fruit um, allows one to judge wisely and make good judgments. Um, if you look in the context of Matthew 7, verse 15 to 20, the context there is being able to discern whether the person that's speaking is speaking truth or not speaking truth, whether they're uh, an honest preacher or a, a bad preacher. But there are two other things that come into this passage, um, because Jesus is also asking us to consider our own hearts so that when we speak, what comes out of our hearts will be something that builds people up. And whatever we say, actually, is coming out the abundance of our heart. And so it matters whether our heart is good or whether it matters or, or whether our heart is bad. And so we need to do two other things with this passage. We need to recognise what a good and bad heart really looks like and ask ourselves, what have I got? And also we need to recognise what good and bad fruit is. And then we're in a position to be able to judge rightly. What about this good and bad hearts then? Do you know, <clears throat> we know from the parable of the sower in Luke 8, uh, round about verse 15, that uh, at the end of the parable of the sower, we get this, uh, he with a good and noble heart produces, and he speaks about the great fruit that gets produced. So a good heart is one that is what Jesus described as a good and noble heart, one that is full of God one that is submitted to God, one that recognises that without him, they can do nothing. But then there's this, if that's a good heart, what's a bad heart like? Well, just again, referring to that parable of the uh, sower, which I guess is quite well known to you and appears in the Gospels, um, it talks about, you know, uh, the seed, which is the word of God, um, being 
taken away by the birds and never actually getting into your heart. So the, the, a bad heart is one that's been robbed. It's been robbed of the truth that uh, it could have received. Also, it speaks of um, uh, seed that falls into ground that has weeds that grow up and choke. And so that's to do with a neglected heart. We'll look at these in detail. And then the third part that gets mentioned in that same parable in Luke 8 is stony ground. That is hardened hearts. And, and so Jesus is trying to make sure that we, we've examined our hearts so that, we, that what we say uh, comes out of a good heart, not a bad heart. Do you know, wh why do people get robbed of the word of God? Well, actually, it's this problem that's going to come up over and over again in this passage. It is a pride. It's this thing that says, oh, I, 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 I haven't got time for that. I don't need that. And the birds, as it were, come and eat it and take it away and it's gone. Or neglect it, where somebody says, you know, you really need to think about these things. You need to give some consideration of why Jesus came. Oh, no, I, I haven't got time for that. And, and neglect something to, that really actually is going to choke and it's, it's going to prevent growth in your life. And this third thing, that as we do those things, as we push God away and say, oh, I'll think about it later. Actually, the Bible talks about we can become hardened. We get a hardened heart. And that's like the stony ground. So that eventually we become more and more hardened against the things of God and less and less willing to consider his word and his love in our lives. Because if out of the abundance of our hearts, our mouths are going to speak, we need to know what it is that causes our hearts to turn bad. And one of these things, as I've already mentioned, is this pride. Um, pride being the complete opposite of humility. C.S. Lewis, um, in his book, uh, Mere Christianity, which I've been reading, uh, uh, rereading recently, he says this. There is one sin of which no man in the world is free, which everyone in the world loathes when he sees it in somebody else, and of which hardly any people except Christians ever imagine that they could be guilty of themselves, and it is pride. He also goes on to note that it was through pride that Lucifer, who was uh, you know, one of the foremost in heaven, responsible in heaven, actually became what the Bible descri describes as the evil one or the devil. And it was his pride where he said, I will be like God. And um, pride leads to every other vice, says C.S. Lewis. It is actually the complete anti-God state of mind. And uh, so he goes on to say that, you know, as long as we are proud, we cannot know God. And I think he, he, I've really found this very helpful because he says, a proud man or a proud woman is always looking down on things and on people. And then he goes on to say, and of course, as long as you're looking down, you cannot see someone or something that is above you. And uh, I suppose to just recognise that, we'd have to look back at this previous part that I already read from uh, Luke 6, verse 37. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will be not condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. And there Jesus is contrasting this hardened heart and this looking down, this prideful heart that wants to condemn others and make himself look better instead of the good heart that wants to produce this, these, these words of encouragement and give, and it will be given to you. Um, forgive, uh, which comes from a humble heart. So we're going to ask this question then, well, how do I know if I'm proud? I mean, I've got to ask the question. And uh, Maybe one of the questions that C.S. Lewis poses in his book, Mere Christianity, which I would recommend reading uh, to you, he says this. If you want to know if you're proud, ask yourself this question. How much do I dislike it when other people snub me or refuse to take any notice of me? Don't they know who I am? 
Why don't they take any notice of me? How rude of them. And then he goes on to say, you know, in God, we meet somebody who in every respect is immeasurably superior to ourselves. And unless we recognize God as that and know ourselves as nothing in comparison, we don't know God at all. Pride is a spiritual cancer. It eats up every possibility of love and contentment and even common sense. So how, how is it that out of the abundance of our heart, we're going to produce uh, good fruit if in fact pride has taken up residence in our lives? So we've looked a little bit just briefly at um, what does a bad and good heart look like? And we've seen that a good heart is one that is full of God. And a bad heart is one that's submitting itself to pride on a daily basis. Well, I suppose we also need to, need also to ask this question, um, what does good and bad fruit look like? Because it says in this passage, it says um, each, each tree is recognised by its, its, its fruit. And then goes on to say people don't pick uh, figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. You know, you, you, you don't get these, these what you're expecting by going to the wrong sort of tree and the, uh, the wrong and picking the wrong sort of fruit. As I said um, earlier, um, Matthew Henry is saying that the fruit uh, that uh, we're looking at is all to do with the words or the, the actions that come out of our, our mouths. And uh, as I've looked at just now, and I'd ask you just to turn back for a moment, it says here that the, the fruit of a good tree has these words. I'll read it again, verse 37. Do not judge, you will not be judged. Do not condemn, you will not be condemned. But forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And so we see that the, um, the fruit of a good tree involves forgiving and giving and that requires humility to be able to say i forgive you as you've apologized i forgive you it it it, it, it means that we we've, we've got to re recognize actually the only reason i have been forgiven by god is because of his mercy and his grace to me and it behoves me to pass on that mercy and grace to others as well in the same way that i have received his mercy and, and, and the, the, the fruit of a bad tree from that verse is obviously these two things, judging and condemning, which I've already described as the, the, the outflow of pride. What we need to notice in all this is that um, a good man or a good woman may not always be bringing about abundant fruit all the time, but what they do bring when they bring it is good. And the other thing we need to notice is that a bad man may be like a tree with um, you know, abundant leaves and, uh, and be very impressive with all the activity. But actually, when you come to look through the leaves, as Jesus did on one occasion, looking for fruit in a fig tree, all he saw was leaves, but he found no fruit at all. So it's not just an outward thing. Lots of activity, all the right words, saying the right things. Actually, actually, what God is saying is, I want you to look for fruit. And I want you to seek fruit in your own lives. I, I want you to seek this, the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life. That will then bless others. There are some misunderstandings that perhaps we ought to also look at here as we pr uh, press on. Because um, uh, is it wrong then uh, to take pleasure in being praised? You know, one of the things it says, the Bible says that God wants to do when we stand before him is be able to say, well done, good and faithful servant. So we say, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want to be proud. If I, if, I, if I say thank you for that, I should become proud. No, no, no. That's not the problem. Actually, I think it's good when somebody says, well done, you played that instrument really well. You blessed me when you said that. that when, you, when you said that word of encouragement, it really helped me. Actually, 
the right thing to say is thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It helps me to to know that what I did um, uh, has helped you. The problem comes when we start thinking, do you know, I'm really something I know. I've really blessed that person. I really must be something. And I'm better than these other people. That's when the pride comes in. It's not wrong to receive thanks where thanks are due. And in fact, sometimes it helps us to understand a little bit of how God is using us by the things that people genuinely say to us when they say that was really helpful. Thank you. I mean, help us think, wow, maybe that's the way, Holy Spirit, you're working in my life. And we can begin to understand the gift of God that is emerging in our lives. See, the opposite of that, oh, no, 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 it wasn't me, sort of is, is smarmy. It's, it, and that's, that's not real humility at all. Uh, the smarmy person, somebody who's always telling you, um, you know, of course, oh, oh, no, I'm a nobody. Actually, they're really hoping that you say, oh, no, 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 you are really important. And keep building them up because actually they're terribly insecure. I think that's an important thing as the church grows, that we are able to uh, give uh, uh, encouragement and um and, 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 and say to people, that's really helpful. And that in receiving that, we're saying, Lord, thank you. For I, I'm seeing more clearly the work that you're doing in my life. And for many of us, we're saying, uh, 20, 20, 10 years ago, two years ago, I wouldn't have been like that. Lord, that is the, your work in my life. And I thank you for it. The truth of the matter is, is that the better we go to know God, uh, the more humble we will feel in the light of his majesty. Nothing actually can be done before we take this step of knowing God. And um, C.S. Lewis says, if we don't think we are conceited and proud, um, actually we are very conceited and proud indeed. So I just want to sort of end by speaking about myself in this, because um, uh, as I look at this passage, my, 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 my great desire is that um, for me and for you and for each of us, this uh, phrase at the end of um, the, uh, the verse 45 would apply to me and apply to you. Out of the overflow of my heart, I want my mouth to speak. And therefore I'm saying, God, I want, my, I want to have a good heart at all times. I want a heart that's submitted to you. And so that I can be confident then that the fruit that I bring in people's lives will be good fruit and it will be the sort of fruit that that forgives and gives and encourages and strengthens and builds up as opposed to the fruit of a uh, an insecure and a proud heart that um, wants to say things about others that put them down to try and somehow make myself look better what a disaster that is so where am I personally on this to be honest with you I have to be uh, truthful and say I am not personally always free from prideful thoughts. Um, it's the same in the same way that uh, being tempted is not sin. Um, having prideful thoughts come upon you is not sin. It's actually how you deal with them. And um, I, I, I've had to work on this really hard. And... I've asked God to help me. I said, Lord, help me to overcome pride in my life. And uh, the, the thing is, what, what I've, I've said that particularly, I've asked God to help me. I haven't asked him to deliver me from pride because I don't think pride can be dealt with in that way. I've asked him to help me. And I'm going to just explain what I mean by that, that actually in saying, God, I want you to help me. I realize that I have a choice to make each time that prideful thoughts come uh, into my mind. And uh, I, I, I'm tempted to say what I what what the prideful thoughts would produce as fruit in my life. Um, so I've said I've asked God to help me. Um, and, do you know. So when prideful thoughts come into my mind, what I'm finding now is that the Holy Spirit immediately reminds me of the commitment I've made to God, that 
he would help me to overcome pride in my life. And at that point, as I say, I have a choice to make. But that choice is not always easy. I'm going to describe it like this. When prideful thoughts come into my mind and I'm tempted to put people down and so on, do you know what? They are often like juicy morsels that for a moment create a delicious taste in my mouth. And I'm tempted, just this delicious morsel, I'll say this. But you know what? What I've discovered is this. When I say things that put others down or try to make myself look better than I am, actually, immediately I say them, that juicy morsel turns sour in my mouth. I don't know whether you've read the uh, or seen the film of uh, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, where Edmund, when they come back into uh, Narnia, uh, meets the White Witch, and she offers him a delicious Turkish delight, which he sees and he wants. And, of course, then he tells uh, the White Witch all the information about uh, the brothers and sisters coming back into Narnia, and she immediately becomes the nasty person that she is. So where this scripture is encouraging us to be good, uh, a good tree, have good hearts, it's encouraging us to um, have good fruit, which is the fruit that, that gives and forgives, the fruit that builds others up and strengthens them rather than um, condemning others and putting others down. You and I have a choice. But God wants us to succeed in this. He wants us to have good and noble hearts. And we have a choice to say, God, my desire is that increasingly I would become a good tree. I'll be one that has fruit that builds up, that strengthens, that encourages, and that sees, in fact, the very thing that I pray regularly, that your kingdom would come in my life in the lives of others. So I hope as you just consider this little passage, small number of verses that they are, and yet powerful as they are, that you with me would submit yourself to the one who is above us and the one who draws us upwards into his life, that we would be those who it is true of that out of the abundance of our hearts, that when our mouths speak, because our hearts are full of God and not full of pride, the fruit that emerges out of our lips and out of our actions and out of our thoughts and out of our conversations would be such that it is really good fruit and it produces a harvest in not only our lives, but in the lives of others. May I just pray with us in the light of those scriptures. Heavenly Father, this is not an easy passage. And Father, you've given it to us as a warning and as a, a direction of encouragement for us. That Lord, first of all, we might be able to judge wisely situations and things that people say, but also that we might constantly look into our own hearts and be praying on a daily basis that our lives would and our hearts would be full of the goodness of God, that indeed your kingdom will come in our lives first and then in the lives of others, and that your name would be honoured through the things we say and the things we do, and that the result of that would be that others who come across us and with whom we speak might be built up and might have their eyes set above themselves also, as we are, to look at the one who is almighty and whose grace never ends and whose love is being poured out upon them, if only they would receive it. So we submit ourselves to you, Lord, that your kingdom would come and your will would be done in our lives on a daily 
basis. In Jesus' name, amen.